Hi everyone! Welcome to the History of New Media Art. I'm your instructor, Jackie Gleisner. The focus of today's lecture is the intersection between video and politics. By now, you've probably noticed that we have been spending quite a lot of time talking about video. That's because, perhaps more than any other medium, video has impacted the art world. And of course, it continues to be a relevant medium, as so much of the media we are exposed to is still video. During the last lecture, we looked at video art and video installations. We saw how artists began to work with installations as a way of controlling the environments for viewers to experience their video works. These built environments had a natural connection to the theme of surveillance, which we looked at through the works of numerous media artists. For instance, this is named June Pike's ambitious installation, Electronic Superhighway, with over 300 TV screens contributing to a map of the United States outlined in neon lights, the work reflects the geographic boundaries and cultural interior of this country. This massive installation was simultaneously a celebration of the freedom and access of information, as well as a more critical statement on the difficulty of making sense of so much information. We have already discussed the different ways that have contributed to the overall feeling of turmoil during the 1960s and 1970s, especially in this country. Over these two decades, artists responded to political unrest in a variety of new ways such as happenings, performances, events, and installations. And these new forms of art challenged conventions about seeing, experiencing, and viewing artwork. Naturally, artists turned to video as a way of engaging with political themes as the technology gains momentum. We are going to look at several examples of politically charged videos, and the names of the artists have been listed here for your convenience. We'll start with the work of Frank Gillette, the American artist and pioneer of video art. In 1969, Gillette exhibited Wipe Cycle at the Howard Wise Gallery in New York City. This installation was made in collaboration with Iris Schneider and presented in the show TV as a Creative Medium. Using pre-recorded information, as well as a live feed to buck trends of passive view art viewing, viewers stood in front of a cube of nine monitors with cameras mounted above. Viewers were then confronted with footage from a variety of sources. They would also occasionally see themselves in real time, as well as footage from with a delay. It's vital for students to remember that seeing oneself on a screen during the 1960s when this work was first exhibited would have been a very unique and extremely rare experience. This work is an essential work. This is an essential work within the history of video art as it is one of the very first experiences for a viewer to be part of a closed circuit, meaning that the audience would see itself in real time. Note the schematic drawing on this slide detailing the complicated cycle of real-time and recorded footage. Gillette explained, It's an attempt to reshuffle one's temporal experience, one's sense of time and space. It was an attempt to demonstrate that you're as much a piece of information as tomorrow's headlines. Ira Schneider, Gillette's collaborator on this piece, also said, the most important function of Wipe Cycle was to integrate the audience into the information. It was a live feedback system which enabled the viewer standing within its environment to see himself not only now in time and space, but also 8 seconds ago and 16 seconds ago. It was an attempt to demonstrate that you're as much a piece of information as tomorrow's headlines. In essence, Schneider and Gillette were implicating the audience into the political events of the day. Next up is the Irish Tapes, which was exhibited as a multi-channel installation that featured footage of the conflict in Northern Ireland shot between the years of 1971 and 1973. This work is significant because it was one of the first documentaries created with half-inch portable equipment. John Riley and Stephen Moore of the Global Village shot over 100 hours of footage in Northern Ireland, documenting one of the most violent points in the decades-long conflict. 
Reflecting on their experiences, Riley and Moore said, several of us at Global Village started to work with the National Association of Irish Freedom. We had no idea that before we were finished, we'd travel thousands of miles on a laughable budget, shoot 100 hours of tape with relatively untested equipment, face sniper fire, get ourselves arrested at gunpoint, break many of the major rules and probably all the minor ones about sensible production methods, and somehow, after nearly a year in the editing room, end up with the first major documentary done on half-inch videotape. We've previously touched on the works of Dara Birnbaum in this class, especially her video Technology Transformation from 1978 to 1979 seen here. You may recall that Birnbaum used footage from the TV show to deconstruct the mythical icon. After this work, Birnbaum garnered intention, attention and she created several other video installations that engaged with the politics of the moment. For example, PM Magazine was an assault on mass media by using appropriated video. Culling from televised imagery and video, Birnbaum again probed the idea of womanhood, specifically one that has been crafted to satisfy the male gaze. Please watch the short excerpt of this video linked on this page. Then, in 1990, Birnbaum created Tiananmen Square Break-In Transmission. This work looked at the role of media in the student uprisings in China. Birnbaum was also one of the first artists to use video walls, copying stored play displays as seen here in her 1989 work, Rio Video Wall. This work was a permanent outdoor installation of 25 monitors installed in a shopping plaza in Atlanta, Georgia. And here's another view of the work during the daytime. One of Birnbaum's contemporaries was the American artist Judith Berry. Part of the feminist movement from the 1970s in the U.S., Berry was critical of the public function of art and media. Kaleidoscope from 1979 was an early video that explored issues of female identity. In this video, family characters argue about feminist theories. Another work, In Hard Cell from 1994, shown on this slide, included video monitors, projectors, discarded computers, a defibrillator, and other defunct technologies spilling out from a corroding shipping crate. Italian artist Fabrizio Plezzi also turned his eye on the impermanence of technology in his installation entitled Bronx at the 1986 Venice Biennale. This video installation included 26 TV sets, placed screens with screens facing up in rusted metal containers with shovels plunged into their screens. The shovels were also reflected in a projection of blue water on each of the sets. Canadian artist Stan Douglas took on the subject of the news head-on in his work Evening from 1994. This work included a reenactment of a family watching the evening news <clears throat> during the 1960s and 70s. Using archival footage from the time, Douglas shows the TV news anchors smiling broadly regardless of the atrocities they report on, such as the Vietnam War, uprising associated with the civil rights movement, etc. Ted Turner's cable news network, CNN, had bought brought the ubiquity of the news to a completely new level during the mid-90s. The speed of the news was growing faster and faster. Other artists also took up this very subject. Fabrice Hyper created an entire broadcast studio at the Venice Biennale in 1997. The installation was complete with monitors, furniture, editing, and control rooms where he conducted interviews, did commercials, and held production meetings. In Marcel Odenbach's Ein Faust in der Tasch Machen, Make a Fist in the Pocket, from 1994, <clears throat> this installation showed how seven countries, Germany, the United States, England, France, Italy, Czechoslovakia, and Mexico, maintained order during the uprisings of 1968. Seven monitors showed the footage from that era, spliced with images from the Third Reich of burning books. And lastly, Chantal Ackerman arranged 24 monitors in eight groupings of three and projected fragments of her parents and grandparents in her work, Dest, from 1993. 
Still other artists focused on the experience of immigrants as a way of engaging with the political climate of their time. Polish artist Krzysztof Wojcicki created Xenology, Immigrant Instruments, a project that he began in 1992. The work features interviews that are combined with images of the same people riding subways or standing in front of public buildings in their newly adopted countries. In Sukran Aziz's piece Reminisces from 1998, the artist videotaped interviews of people in Istanbul, New York, Paris, as well as other cities. The footage was projected onto the walls while hundreds of small speakers throughout the space hung from the ceiling playing audio of pre-recorded conversations about memory as well as displacement. We are going to touch on two more important works before we close out today's lecture. First is Marina Abramovich's Balkan Baroque. Abramovich presented this work at the 1997 Venice Biennale. It was a three-screen installation accompanied by three large copper vessels. On one screen, the artist talks about rats who were slaughtered, who slaughtered their own kind, while on the other screen, there were images of the artist's parents. As Abramovich stops talking, her mother raises a gun to her father's head and covers her eyes. Please watch the excerpt of the video linked on this page. The installation at the Biennale included cow bones as well. Taking the subject of the war in Bosnia as its subject, Abramovich explained, the whole idea that by washing bones and trying to scrub the blood is impossible. You can't wash the blood from your hands as you can't wash the shame from the war. But also it was important to transcend it. That can be used, this image, for any war anywhere in the world. So to become from personal, there can be universal. And finally, please watch Shira Nishat's Turbulent from 1998, which is linked on this slide. Turbulent was also shown at the Venice Biennale, and this work won the top prize for the international exhibition, The Lion Dior, in 1999. It is a two-screen film installation that visualizes the schism in gender roles, cultural power, as well as injustices in Iran. Today we have looked at many examples of video and video installations with a com common theme of engaging with political themes, especially how these political messages are communicated through mass media. We started with Frank Gillette's White Cycle, one of the first works to incorporate closed circuit footage. And we ended with one of the most critically acclaimed works by the Iranian artist Shirin Nishat. Like many of Nishat's other works, Turbulent takes the differences between men and women, especially as these differences relate to the Islamic culture of her native country, Iran, as its primary target. Thank you for watching today. See you all soon.